floods. They are clearly catastrophic, traumatic events, although they have also been responsible for one of the most memorable clips in the history of broadcast news. Good morning. Well, obviously, we're getting a nice break from the rain, but not the flooding. This is essentially now a part of the Passaic River in this neighborhood. That's it. Fuck James Cameron and fuck Titanic, because that is now officially the greatest boat disaster ever captured on film. It's over. Now, floods were everywhere this summer. Think of them as the despacito of natural disasters. <laughs> Persistent, ubiquitous, and absolutely no fault of the Puerto Rican government. And floods are always threatening. 90% of all natural disasters in the US involve a flood, which is, I assume, the reason that FEMA's website once referred to flooding as America's number one natural hazard, exclamation mark. <laughs> which is a pretty weird tone to take when describing something horrible. It's like saying, boils, America's number one staph infection. <laughs> or parks, America's number one place to die unnoticed. <laughs> And floods are only going to get worse due to climate change. And I know that there are people who will dispute that. And we just don't have time tonight to litigate whether extreme weather events are exacerbated by climate change. So for now, let's just say... They are. Yeah. <laughs> they just definitely are. I mean, sure, 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 it is, it is a complicated issue. And we may not have definitive proof until the late 1980s. But... <laughs> But while floods are often referred to as natural disasters, the truth is the damage they do is often, to some extent, within our control. Because we have made certain decisions that put and keep people and property in the path of flooding. And that is what this story is about. And before we go any further, let's acknowledge that people live near water for all sorts of reasons. For some, it's where their families have lived for generations, uh, or a necessity for the work that they do. Uh, for others, it's a luxury. And, and living next to the water is undoubtedly attractive, despite the risks, like flooding, or stepping on pointy seashells, <laughs> or mistakenly giving a Tostito to a seagull without realising that that means that you will now spend the rest of your life haunted by a Tostito-addicted seagull. <laughs> the point is, whatever the reason to live by the water, many do... Oh, for fuck's sake! You've got to be kidding! I don't have any Tostitos! I've been telling you that for six years! Look, no Tostitos! No Tostitos! Get out of here! Get out of here, you flying beach rats! <laughs> Sorry. The... the point is, the dangers of waterfront living are real, but many people, like this man, uh, who lives on the water in Tampa Bay, feel the benefits outweigh the risks. Mark knows that life here is tenuous, but he doesn't dwell on it. Every morning when I walk out to get the paper, I see dolphins frolicking in the bayou and roseate spoonbills walking around the edge of the bayou. So it tends to make you forget about all those sorts of things. Sure, I, I can imagine that seeing a roseate spoonbill would take your mind off things because you're spending your whole day trying to figure out how a flamingo could have gotten its stupid bird face stuck into a panini press. <laughs> I'm just saying, even people who like birds don't like this bird. <laughs> the Audubon Society, an organisation whose entire purpose is to champion birds, says they are, quote, gorgeous at a distance and bizarre up close. <laughs> Which is like the American Kennel Club saying, we celebrate all dogs and honour them as man's best friend. But the dandy Dinmont has a trash personality and looks like a Scotty fucked Phil Spector. <laughs> And look, look, if you are literally overlooking a bayou like that guy, you are probably aware that flooding is a risk. But not every flood-prone area is directly along the coast. And sometimes aggressive development can exacerbate the risk of flooding, even considerably inland. Just look at Houston, uh, which was recently rocked by Harvey. The metro area's development has exploded. One study found the Houston area has added 25% more pavement over 15 years replacing soil-rich wetlands that could absorb water with concrete-covered suburbia. Exactly, and that made Harvey's damage significantly worse. Concrete isn't good at absorbing water. That is why people don't dry off at the beach by rolling around in the parking lot. <laughs> but, but it's not just global warming or unchecked growth that have put more people in risky flood-prone areas. It's also the fact that it's frequently only possible for people to take that risk because they have flood insurance. Just look at Buying the Beach. It's a house hunters type show for people who want to live near the water. And one episode featured two brothers named Mitch and Daniel arguing over a particular beach house, which led to this exchange. Well, what'd you think about the island house, Mitch? Well, I think there was a lot of good and a lot of bad on it. Right off the steps into the beach, can't be beat. We are really close to the water. That's just another thing that's got me concerned. Well, that's what insurance is for. 
That's what insurance is for. That may be the most reckless statement ever said on a boat. And I'm very much including, I can definitely make this shot work. <laughs> and, hey, let's feed these girls some Tostitos. I don't have any. All I did was say the word, get out of here. No Tostitos. No Tostitos. <laughs> but Mitch, no Tostitos. <laughs> but, but Mitch, Mitch isn't wrong that if they bought that house, they could get flood insurance, and surprisingly cheaply. And it's worth taking some time to understand why that is the case. Because, unlike other forms of homeowners insurance, flood protection is actually underwritten by the government through the NFIP, or National Flood Insurance Programme. It started nearly 50 years ago, after historic floods wiped out many people's homes in the 1960s. And the government back then realised that there was a real problem. Insurance companies wouldn't cover floods at an affordable cost, because it was too risky. So, because of that, the government was spending way too much on disaster relief. So, they stepped in and created the NFIP, which offered significantly discounted insurance to encourage people to buy it. And that sounds great, but crucially, the aim at the time was not that people would be staying in at-risk homes permanently, as the program's current administrator explains. They presumed that if we told people they were at risk, they would move. They presumed that over the life of the program, those discounts wouldn't need to be con uh, continued. And they presumed they wouldn't need to be continued because once people knew they had the risk, they would move out. That has not proven true. No, but of course it hasn't, because that's not how people work. We will gladly accept huge risks to our personal safety for the sake of a discount. That was the entire premise behind the McDonald's dollar menu. <laughs> And that is just one of the many flaws with how this well-intentioned program was designed, because everything about it, from who participates, to where the money goes, to the incentives it creates, needs fixing. And let's start with the fact that eligibility for the program is determined through floodplain maps. You are required to buy flood insurance if you have a federally-backed mortgage and FEMA's maps show that you live in a risky area. Unfortunately, the mandate has been poorly enforced, meaning that lots of people don't buy insurance who should, and the maps themselves can be both out of date and wildly inaccurate. In fact, just days before Harvey struck, a study of Houston area flood maps was published, and the results were alarming. Over the course of a decade, researchers at Rice University and Texas A&M Galveston studied one section of southeast Harris County. They found FEMA's floodplain maps missed about 75% of the damages from the storms. 75%? At that point, you might as well predict floods by having blindfolded six-year-olds pin little cardboard puddles onto city maps at birthday parties. But even if all the maps were perfect, there would be another flaw with the NFIP, which is how it's administered. You see, typically, the government doesn't directly insure you. Instead, it pays private insurance companies a fee for every policy they sell. But not just that. The federal government is then responsible for covering any losses, which is a pretty fucking sweet deal for those companies. They take none of the risk, and yet they get all the rewards. But it gets even worse, because they also get paid for each claim they handle. And when Frontline crunched some of the numbers and presented them to a former head of the program, they found something shocking. There was one number that really jumped out. With all the claims in the wake of Sandy, the profits were more than $400 million. Because they're handling a lot of claims that year and they, get, they get, make a lot of money when they handle claims. When a big storm hits then, they make more money. Yeah, at the very time, you need them to make less money, if anything, because, you, because of the burden is going to be borne by the taxpayers. They make a killing. That's true. For insurance companies, the bigger the disaster, the more they stand to profit. And that is a business model not usually seen outside of Nicolas Cage's career. <laughs> And while the insurance industry may dispute exactly how much profit they make, the fact remains that the government and the taxpayer are definitely the ones eating the losses, which is one of the reasons why, even before these latest hurricanes, the program was $25 billion in debt. And there are not enough roseate spoon bills in the world to take your mind off that. And just to be clear, there are exactly enough roseate spoon bills in the world. I I'm just saying, do we all really need more of this? Hey, kids, come see! The dirty pink dinosaur is noisily devouring its young! <laughs> and look, there is a good argument to make that helping people stay in their homes after a disaster is what government is for. 
But remember, a big chunk of that money is just going to the insurance companies, and another shockingly big chunk of that money goes to very few homes. For instance, along the Gulf Coast and Florida, just 1% of properties covered by the NFIP have accounted for a quarter of flood claims. These are called uh, uh, the so-called repetitive loss properties. Now, they, they are homes that can flood over and over and over again, getting payments each and every time. And, and some of them are costing us a fortune. Just recently, an article in the Washington Post highlighted a home in Poincapé Parish that has flooded 40 times. While the house is valued at just $56,000, the NFIP has doled out nearly $430,000 to cover flood claims. So that is just stupid. Because if nothing else, if your house floods 40 times, Mother Nature is sending you a pretty clear message. And that message is, hey, would you mind leaving? Some weird fish would like to fuck in here now. <laughs> And some parts of the country have particularly extreme examples of this. Now, you remember Mitch and Daniel? The pastel death trap that they were looking at is on a place <laughs> called Dolphin Island, where over the past two decades, homeowners have paid just $9.3 million in premiums into the NFIP, but they've received $72.2 million in payments for their damaged homes. It is so bad that the island got written up by Bloomberg under the headline, Love of Coastal Living is Draining US Disaster Funds. And at first glance, we thought, hold on, isn't that the exact same <laughs> I saw on stilts that Mitch and Daniel almost bought? Well, the good news is it's actually not. The bad news is it's literally the house next door and it was also featured on a different episode of Buying the Beach. It's right in the water. It wasn't close to the beach. It was in the ocean. The waves are just right here. Whew. It's it literally thing? in the ocean. This is insane. Yeah, it is insane. <laughs> but what's even crazier is, at the end of the episode, they decided to buy that house! <laughs> but, but even if you are able to overlook the repetitive lost properties, which you shouldn't, there is another issue, and that is that nearly one out of every five homes covered under the NFIP is a second home. And because the programme isn't means-tested, the benefits frequently go to some wealthy individuals' vacation homes. One such property belonged to John Stossel, a Fox News personality and partially hydrogenated Tom Selleck. <laughs> and, and I'll let Stossel, who really answers the question, what if Freddie Mercury had quit singing to become an assistant floor manager at Men's Warehouse, <laughs> I'll, I'll let him tell you all about it, because even he knew it was ridiculous. Years ago, I built this beach house. That's younger me there. The house was on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. A risky place to build, but I built anyway. Cause a federal program guaranteed my investment. Eventually a storm swept away my first floor, but I didn't lose a penny. Thanks, I never invited you there, but you paid for my new first floor. Okay, so now Stossel is clearly just baiting people because under no circumstances does anyone want to be funding the reconstruction of the world's smuggest man's rickety sea prison. <laughs> And there is lots to be confused about there, not, not least of which that photo of Stossel posing shirtless in skin-tight white swim trunks from hundreds of feet away. Who took that photo? <laughs> it can't be another human who wanted it. So, here's my guess. I think that he put a camera on a long delay timer, then sprinted for a full 45 seconds back to the deck of his house, whispering, hurry, hurry, hurry to himself the entire time, and got in position just in time for that photo to happen. That is the only scientifically possible explanation. We debated this the entire fucking week, and it's the only scenario that we could all agree on. And look, look, here's, here's the thing. If, if you choose to build something in a risky place, like John Stossel's salt-battered bottoms-only beach mistake. <laughs> you should absolutely be allowed to do that. But you shouldn't expect the government to repeatedly help you rebuild when things inevitably go wrong. However, the vast majority, the vast majority here, of NFIP beneficiaries are not wealthy or second-home owners. They often really need this programme and cannot afford for it to go under. And for those stuck in repetitive loss properties, it is easy for anyone to just say they should move. They should just move. But it's much more difficult than that, as this Kentucky woman whose home has flooded repeatedly will tell you. We couldn't sell our house. Who would want to buy a house that's had this many repetitive floods in it? Who would want to buy a house? We have neighbours that have had their houses up for sale for two and three years and haven't even had anyone come and view the houses. We need a buyout from, from FEMA or from whoever it is that 
is responsible for this. Right. And her decision to try and leave that home could not have been easy because you don't want to throw out the baby with the flood water. <laughs> but at a certain point, the responsible thing to do is to get a better, more water-resistant baby. <laughs> which is, incidentally, also the title of Britain's best-selling book on teaching children to swim. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, our buyout programs are hugely underfunded and prohibitively slow. It can take years for buyouts to get approved, by which point homeowners have probably had to rebuild their house at the government's expense, and it may have already flooded again. So, essentially, a government program that was supposed to help people in flooded homes is sometimes trapping them inside them indefinitely. And trapping people in structurally unsound homes isn't what the government is for, it's what buying the beach is for. <laughs> Look, th there just has to be a better way here, and there are some key things that we can do to improve this program. We can do things like means test it, uh, and eventually get rid of discounts for second homes, and gradually increase the insurance rates on some properties so that they reflect actual risk. Unfortunately, the last time the Congress tried a major reform of the NFIP with the Bigot Waters Act of 2012, the result was that many people's rates skyrocketed overnight, and politicians were so spooked by angry constituents, they significantly scaled back many of the reforms. And I'm not saying that this will ever be politically easy, because even if you do properly fund and streamline a buyout scheme, there are still going to be cases where people just want to stay put. Right here in New York, there is a low-lying community called Broad Channel, where the streets can flood twice a month. Its residents fought against those rate increases a few years ago, and many of them have no interest in leaving. No, the neighborhood's too great, then. <laughs> Listen, my whole house got destroyed by Sandy, and I, you know, I redid my whole house. I, you know, people are like, you're crazy, you should move. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> but you're standing in water right now. Maybe the people telling you to move were saying, at the very least, can you move up five inches to dry land? <laughs> but the hard truth here is, even expensive interventions are likely to only buy that community a little more time. And people in Broad Channel will eventually be leaving, whether it's by moving truck or by boat, because environmental conditions are going to get worse. Heavy downpours have increased in the last 50 years, and sea levels have been climbing steadily. And I'm not saying that that is because of climate change, even though... It is. Yeah. <laughs> it just is. It just... It just is, precisely. The NFIP is actually due for reauthorization this December, and I would argue that it's time to take another shot at serious, thoughtful reform. Because without it, we have an unstable, unsustainable program that is indirectly harming some of the people that it was designed to help. And c I, do I don't have any... To I've chosen the last ja, time... Ja, relax. Any... I'm not here for Tostitos. Really? Yeah. yeah hold on. You, you, you can talk? Well, of course. Seagulls can talk. We just choose to listen most of the time. Oh, well, that's, that's actually very nice. And I heard what you were saying about flooding, and you are right. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I'm a seagull. Yeah. Some people in high-risk areas will need to move, and we should give them the help that they can do that with. Right, because okay. while leaving your home is hard, being forced out when it's uninhabitable is ten times harder. Right. And after all, your home isn't just walls and a roof. It's where the people you love are. Oh, Seagull, I've got to say, that was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah. not bad for a flying beach rat. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't talk like that about yourself. <laughs> no, don't. Oh. It's okay. I know it's true. You know it's true. Everybody watching knows it's true. Hey, I eat french fries out of the garbage. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you make a good point. You're absolutely disgusting. But, but you know what? I am truly sorry for misjudging your motives in coming here. Oh, that's okay, Johnny. Yeah. Uh, just one more thing. Sure, anything. You have any Tostitos? Fuck you! No! 